Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Polaris Live. This is your host, Sarwar Kashmiri, inviting our viewers from around the world to this series of conversations on U.S.-China relations, perhaps the most consequential issue of our time. This series is brought to you under the auspices of the Foreign Policy Association in New York. I have great pleasure today in introducing Professor Li Jing. He is the professor at the Department of Politics and Society, Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanity, Aalborg University, Denmark. His research interests and teaching areas include international political economy, international relations, emerging powers, and world order. In recent years, apart from publishing numerous international and Chinese journal articles, he has edited a number of book series on the theme of the rise of China, emerging powers, and the existing world order. It gives me great pleasure now to bring on stage Professor Li Xing. Professor Li, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Is Thank this you. A, is, this, is, is this a beautiful spring day in Alborg in Denmark? Yes, yes. Today is sunshine. You can see oh. my window. <laughs> yes, and all yes. the all the flowers are out. Yes, it began to grow now. Oh gosh! Well, listen. Thank you for being here, and we have so much to uh, talk about. But let's try. Uh, I, I, I want to pick up on one of the themes that you have mentioned, which is why the West must learn from China, not try to change or destroy it. How do you mean by that? What I want to express myself is that um, the West has a kind of historic understanding on what makes country grow and develop. Okay, this is, a, uh, you know, we all learn different paradigms. We have a, a, a modernization paradigm. We have a middle class paradigm. We have also what we call political authoritarian paradigm. Uh, in terms of modernization theory, it, uh, you know, students all learn that uh, uh, when country is more uh, politically, economically developed, the country will move, will move towards pluralism, towards uh, kind of democracy, okay. But then uh, the second paradigm, uh, paradigm is middle class paradigm, which which teaches that uh, middle class is the agent of development, and uh, middle class will form into different uh, what we call interest groups, and uh, interest group will lead them into different parties. Then you have this multi-party competition, okay. Right. Then we have the last par uh, paradigm we call political authoritarianism. Uh, political, author uh, political authoritarianism will lead country into underdevelopment because such kind of a system does not have innovation. It's very kind of a deadly uh, uh, authoritarian without any uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, innovative ideas. But what China has shown the world is completely opposite. Okay, with China moving towards more and more efferent mm -hmm. society, where China become the second large economy, it has not reached to the ideal image which United States or Europe wants to see. And the Chinese middle class have not been becoming the agent of democracy. That's rather very interesting. They, very rather interesting. they actually support the Chinese Communist Party very much. And also the Chinese so-called authoritarian system is one of the most innovative today. Interesting. This is the paradox now. So U.S. somehow is very puzzled by, this, by these paradoxes. Well, let me ask you, uh, I think I understand exactly what you're saying because I was brought up in India in uh, a Jesuit school and that was pretty much the kind of thinking that was imparted to us. And I think uh, you make a very, very important point is that all of us in the West and uh, are brought up with a certain belief in governance and in transition of governments. And what China is showing is don't try to apply those beliefs blindly, right? That uh, look at what is happening in China. 
uh, and so on. But let me ask you one thing before we go ahead, which is, which is from your European Union perch, how do you use the word West? Do you use the word West yourself, Professor Lee, uh, as a monolithic group of countries uh, led by the United States, especially with respect to China? How do you use the word West? We have, uh, uh, I'm talking, I'm speaking on my, on my behalf, okay? I have uh, used the concept of West in, in, in two situations. One is general sense. Okay. Uh, you have United States, North America, then you have a European Union, then you have also Canada, Australia, uh, all together as, as right. the West. Okay, this is more general. But very often we also refer to U.S. because the U.S. is the symbol of the West. So very often when we talk about international order, Western order, actually it is the U.S. order. Mm. This is what the Chinese delegates told. Uh, <laughs> you know, we were shocked by the dialogue between the two delegates in Alaska uh, several weeks ago, yes. the Chinese delegates said to Americans, US-led order was not, by, by definition, the international order. Right. So here you can see the distinguishing. Uh, sometimes it's referred to general uh, concept of West. Uh, in, in, in other case, it referred to the United States in specific term. Right. Right. And, and do you think that as, uh, as the world has grown and developed in the last decade, especially, uh, that there is some question whether, uh, the, uh, whether the West includes the European Union in all of the ways that it used to at the end of the Second World War? Uh, I think that the so-called West now is uh, in kind of split. Uh, I can see that the U.S. is the U.S. and the European Union become more or less much more independent than before. Right. And you, you have heard that European Union, they have this uh, new idea about having, uh, uh, having a, a European army. Okay, this is a very serious issue. And some of my colleagues from, from, from the university, they, they also have the idea that, uh, that Europe must have its own army. But then the question now is pointing towards NATO. If Europe has its own army, then what's, what's the use of NATO, okay? Right. But anyway, because NATO is under the command of the United States, Europe yeah. does not want to show kind of a, a lower status to the United States all the time. Okay? Right. But don't you think, don't you think that uh, that debate and discussion has gone on for a long time? You know, and uh, uh, and pardon me for saying this, but I think all politicians go to the same school, uh, in a sense. <laughs> yes. And if somebody's paying for Europe's defense, you know, what is the reason for Europe to spend its own money? It, it, it does so many other things, the climate, the health, you know, progressivism and so on. Uh, so why would it ever want to? You uh, point you know. to the key point that uh, because United States paid, so United States has a strong voice. But now my question to United States is that are you willing to pay to be an hegemon again? Ah. And because Biden wants to restore a kind of international coalition in balance in China. Okay. Right. Uh, actually, Chinese interpretation is in in, in pressing China down, okay, not right. letting China rise up. Right. But anyway, that um, my question to the United States is, are you able to do it? I don't think so. I just published an article in Spanish translated by some of my Spanish network and we put together and published. And uh, in that article, I actually challenge uh, Biden for whether he is going to pay the similar kind of support, economic, right. economic support, to sustain such kind of international coalition against the China. I don't think so. It can. Well, uh, and well. because the situation is quite different, the United States must understand today, China is the largest economic partner for more than 120 countries, yes. whereas the United States is half. Even yes. the closest airline of the United States, Japan, Australia, you name it, European Union. China is their largest economic partner. Yes. There is economic consequence if they follow the United States. 
So do you think that the very, that the meaning of the word alliance is starting to change? Because we have always in the US uh, assumed that alliance includes the military component. And China seems to be showing, correct me if I'm wrong, that with its Belt and Road Initiative, it will make many, many, many alliances, and very few of them, at least as we know it now, are going to be militarily dominant. So do you think the word alliance itself is changing? And I ask this because one of the big points uh, advantages people point out and American elites point out is that America has all these allies. China has very few. So I'm wondering if based on what you've said and our discussion, whether the word alliance itself is open to change. It is a big mistake for the United States to think in that way. Let me explain to you that, uh, you know, Chinese term guanxi. Guanxi. Guanxi, which means a relationship. China does not like alliance, but China like making friends. That's different, okay? Making close friends is not equivalent to making alliance. Okay. The danger of making alliance is that you force country to act, to act collectively towards the same line, okay? Right. You can't, in, in modern world, really you can't. During the Cold War, you can. Okay, you can do that at that time because of the Soviet Union, because you have a common enemy. Today, that's why maybe United States wants to restore China as the enemy so the American can revive the alliance. Maybe that's the strategy, but I do not believe that strategy will work. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned about the one belt, one road. China is going to make a lot of friends, but not, I don't think China is going to make alliance because China cannot force those countries to act collectively according to Chinese interests. Mm. I don't think China can. Mm. It understands very clearly. In China, I have a lot of friends, okay? I make a lot of friends, I have a lot of network, guanxi, but I'm not going to make alliance with my friends. Uh -huh. I can't, and, and they cannot do that either. So perhaps that, uh, that uh, it, it, is, it is under wrong error that the United States is trying to still stick to the old understanding of alliance. Of I alliance. hope Biden will change its policy. And so, uh, which leads me to the next thing that I wanted to uh, discuss with you, uh, which is uh, you've made it a point to say that today China's political and economic system is better equipped and perhaps even more sustainable than the American model. Do you still believe this and why? Uh, when I came to the West, uh, after one year, I came to Denmark in 88. After one year, 1989, Berlin Wall collapsed. And then, uh, you know, American uh, political science uh, uh, professor uh, Fukuyama, okay, so, uh, then he, he, he kind of claimed that uh, the universalization of American democracy and free market capitalism. And uh, right. every, you know, the whole world was uh, under this paradigm forever from and now the history, on. History had ended. Yes, you are right. History ended. <laughs> but gradually, gradually, history not only not ended, but a new history began. That uh. is China. Uh, I want you and I want to advise American politicians to look at data from the West, not from China, if you do not trust Chinese data. Data from the West on, for example, on Chinese political system. For example, Harvard University has just published a very important report uh, saying that the Chinese political system is very re uh, re resilient, very resilient. And also you have also a lot of data from uh, International Edman Trust Barometer and also from Ipsos Public Affairs Survey which is right. London-based. You yeah. have all this kind of data for the last five, six years. You can put them together and, and, and can, you can analyze this data, show that the Chinese Communist Party has received the highest support of people. Then you, you have to understand why. How of can Chinese that be? Chinese citizens, support of Chinese citizens? Yes, that inside China, the Chinese population, first, that the two uh, implications. One is the Chinese population, gives the highest support to Chinese government. 
mm. compared with all over the world. Right. Okay. This is not about data. If anyone, if or any audience uh, does not uh, trust, then try to search the data by, data by themselves. Second is the uh, is the uh, uh, trust data. You know, Edman Trust Barometer, which is yeah. international data, and shows that the, that the Chinese people trust their central government even higher than their local government. Right. So, you, United States should ask why. A, a, a political system which the United States think should should collapse, not only not collapse but actually growing much more stronger and uh, receive people's support. And, and why? So, so I'm thinking that uh, I'm really suggesting the United States should uh, should consider that might be the case that China has found its own developed alternative, and for that, the United States should support it. Not because China's development direction does not really verify the Western liberal democracy, the Western uh, uh, free market capitalism, but as long as China can lift millions of millions of people from poverty and turning China from one of the poorest nations in the world into one of the strongest economies in the world, I'm not. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about per capita. China is still. Behind, okay, but China is growing to be a middle class uh, uh, nation, and the, the the population of middle class is growing tremendously. But let me ask you: one of our guests not long ago uh, made the point that future historians. He was talking about this idea that uh, that is uh, still prevalent in the West, that as China becomes richer and, and middle class uh, becomes bigger, that it will surely not be an authoritarian regime anymore. It will become more like the West. And this uh, person, our guest, pointed out, why is it that a 2,000, 3,000 year old culture should transform itself into a governance model that is barely 200 years old. Do you agree with that uh, general thought? I think that even if in the future China is going to be generating a lot of changes, but uh, China will never, nevertheless uh, be different from the West. Because again, that history matters here. We have to study the Chinese cultural history, Chinese social political history. China has been a country which has been ruled under the paradigm of political meritocracy. Okay. What I mean is that in the future, if 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 that person tell you that China is going to change anyway, but I will say that the, the, the main roots of China's political identity, which is which under which China has been historically ruled by the concept political meritocracy will never be changed. If you go to Korea, if you go to Japan, or many other uh, East, East uh, uh, Asian countries, you will find political meritocracy is also the main uh, political uh, kind of ideology. Uh, so let, uh, me, let me turn that around and ask you uh, that uh, uh, that do you think if China's governance uh, and model has been so successful that China aims to push its ideology and governance model as it expands its belt and road goes into other countries or whether China ha ha thinks that no its model is for it but not necessarily for other people uh, you know powers when they've become rich have always expanded their influence and their governance model. Is China headed in the same direction? You know, me, including the Chinese people and Chinese government, all have a strong belief that what China has achieved is Chinese. Okay. It's Chinese. It is. I remember that uh, uh, when Deng Xiaoping was interviewed by uh, was you know uh, by many uh, journalists at that time, even for forty years ago, right? And uh, and he said already at that time that Chinese was Chinese. That you can't learn from us. Uh, the only thing you could you could learn from us is policy consistency. Uh, that was a good uh, good advice mm. from him. Mm. It's because that uh, the China was able to make policy consistent. You know, 
you make policy and you implement it very consistently, okay? Right. So the Chinese never have any intention to teach the world how to behave. I don't think so. I don't. But I do agree there is a theoretical uh, uh, argument that is, you know, the constructive, the constructivist approach, right. and the norm diffusion, uh, symbolic power, those uh, theories uh, teaches that uh, even you do not uh, want to, uh, you know, spread your values around, but your success itself will generate impact. That I agree. Okay, right. that I have no, I have, I have no disagreement. But that maybe is the um, is one of the uh, the points the United States was afraid that the bad road is going to have a great impact on countries around. The bad road, for example, Eastern Europe and even the Balkans, okay, countries in the Balkan, that the Chinese way of, of doing things would have kind of impact on those countries. I published my book. In my book, uh, some uh, scholars from Eastern Europe, they wrote a very good chapter. One of the chapters argue from that direction that uh, the China bad road has this, what they call the principle diffusion or what I call norm diffusion effect. Okay, that's uh, uh, the, on the, uh, uh, the couple of quick questions. One is yesterday's Wall Street Journal pointed out that China is about to release and is already testing uh, the digital yuan. And in the Wall Street Journal's terms, uh, this poses a threat to the U.S. dollar, and therefore a threat to the U.S. Na to U.S. national security. Do you believe that linkage? Logically, yes, it is correct. Okay, um, because you have to understand that the that the Chinese government and Chinese people they are watching what the U.S. has been doing historically. Okay, what I refer here as sanctions. U.S. is able to make sanctions against any country that U.S. doesn't like or, or, or feel that the U.S. must punish them. So every time when they watch how U.S. did, and they, they, the Chinese people or Chinese government, they know the final forceful weapon is the U.S. dollar, not military, is the mm. U.S. dollar. Mm. Okay. And uh, so this is the... This is the area that China must do something, because otherwise you will be kind of, uh, you know, uh, what they call it, uh, in, in Chinese we call it char boards. It means that you you uh, you 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 kind of uh, cut somebody's uh, throat, uh, yes. uh, and make uh, make that person uh, uh, injured. Yes. So in, 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 in so in my understanding, definitely the New York Times has a point, but that exactly is the direction. Not only China, honestly speaking, European Union is also calculating in that way that that, that they they want to expand uh, euro as well. Right. Uh, uh, which country does not want to have a plural? Of course, some country they want the U.S. Uh, because they have a strong ally with the United States. They might want to United States to protect them. So once the United States is strong, they feel secured. Okay. For those country, my they might think otherwise, but. For countries which the United States consider as a challenger, <clears throat> definitely they are looking for possibilities which they can not demise the US dollar, but to find alternatives where they will not be hurt by US sanctions. Right. It's uh... Now listen, uh, as we get to the remaining part of our uh, conversation, which I wish could go on forever. Uh, what I would like to do is ask you for some thoughts. Uh, if you were writing an agenda uh, for uh, President Biden uh, dealing with China, as you know, these conversations, uh, Professor Lee, are going to be uh, used to write a series of suggestions and agenda for President Biden, uh, new strategy to deal with China uh, by the Foreign Policy Association. This will be published in June, forwarded to Congress, the Senate, think tanks in Washington, posted for anyone to download. So what I want to do in the remaining time that we have is ask you for some thoughts. 
on what you, if you were sitting alone with Mr. Biden, would say, here's what I think you should do. I will say to President Biden is that uh, your identification of China, your understanding of China, okay, whether you trade China as an enemy, whether you trade China simply as a systemic rival, or whether you trade China as equal partner, this is the key issue. I remember Professor uh, Kisho Mapubeni when he served as I think you also interviewed him once when he served as ambassador in the in the in the, in the United States. In the, he he was shocked uh, by uh, uh, by the fact that when he talked about uh, China as equal power to the United States, uh, every American shied away. So what's wrong with that in mm. his mind? Like he asked, what's wrong with that? So Biden must find a correct uh, identification for China, okay? China is, I think, challenger, definitely. But China is not enemy. China is not enemy. China does not want to destroy the United States. Actually, if you look at the financial crisis in, nine, in 2008, in many, many, t uh, and also many, uh, many occasions, actually, China wished United States to, to stay mm. stronger, because right. the Chinese economy depend on the United States in some aspects. Right. So it was totally wrong to infer that China wish the United States to collapse. I do not have that idea at all. And I believe now the United States is on the way to decline, but I believe the United States is a country which has a lot of re resilience as, as well. Okay, as well. China, United States is a country of innovation. Okay, yeah. when I went to United States several times, when I sit in the bus and when I look at people reading all kind of newspapers, this is a very uh, culturally rich country. Of course, um, well, well, I, the United States does not have a mainstream a na a nation culture, but it's immigrant culture, but it has uh, this strength. But now I create culture strains also decline, you have this racial issue come up. This is because of economic decline, maybe also a lot of problems because of because of uh, a, a Trump presidency, okay? So my advice to Biden is that you have to identify China correctly. Mm. And uh, China can be a good collaborator, cooperator, rather than uh, this uh, stabilizer. So, that is the most important and trade China as equal partner and recognize China now is a power, okay? Maybe a power not ideally to your heart, okay? Because of the paradox I mentioned, okay? You wish China to be a, a Christian, a, a, a liberal democracy like country, but China has never been, even after, uh, you know, uh, during the second world war, United States supported Chiang Kai-se, severely at any cost, but nevertheless, the United States could not stop China being becoming a communist country. Right. But we have to understand communism in different way. Okay. Anyway, right. this is my advice to Biden. I think that's a very uh, interesting advice you've given, especially in context with what you've said a few moments earlier, which is when you visit America, you sit in the bus, you see people reading all kinds of things, and you're quite admiring of the knowledge that is freely available in America. And Very so much. from you then, the, the statement that identifying the true nature of China is the most important thing for Mr. Biden, I think is uh, quite a powerful statement uh, that that you have made. Uh, so, but, but, but listen, in the few me uh, seconds that we have left, uh, let me just say that this has been a real experience uh, talking to you, uh, not just for me, but I believe all of the viewers from around the world who look at Polaris Live uh, uh, every, uh, every week. Uh, and I particularly want to thank you because I do believe uh, that the relationship between China and the U.S. is going to define not just what happens to each country, each of the two countries, but also what happens to the, to the rest of the world. And so uh, 
so I applaud you. I thank you for coming on the uh, uh, on Polaris Live, and uh, I hope to see you again uh, before too long. Thank you for your invitation. It's my honor, and uh, I'm very happy to share of some of my thoughts with you and with other audience. Thank you very much. Sincerely. So let me, let me te thank you. So let me tell our audience, I'm afraid that's the only time we have. Please go to uh, kashmiri.com uh, to get a listing of uh, the future guests of, on Polaris Live. Uh, please sign up, register to support us, and see. I hope to see you next Tuesday. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>